My name is Belen Bonilla. I am the Strategic Engagement Associate here at PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute in Washington, DC. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. Today, we are here to talk about our latest survey report, The Faith Factor in Climate Change, How Religion Impacts American Attitudes on Climate and Environmental Policy. So we're going to start off with a presentation from our CEO, Dr. Melissa Duckman, followed by some thoughts, remarks from, uh, from our amazing panelists uh, that we have today. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please add them to the Q&A box. We'll have time to reply to them in the second half of this event. But yeah, thanks for joining us so early this morning to talk about some interesting report findings and to learn some new things. So I am now going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Melissa Duckman. She's the CEO of our Public Religion Research Institute and a political scientist studying the impact of gender, religion, and age on public opinion and political behavior. She's the author of Tea Party Women and the award-winning book School Board Battles, The Christian Right in Local Politics, and her research has appeared in major national news media outlets, including New York Times, CNN, The Hill, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Politico. Uh, so it's all yours, Melissa. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Belen, for the introduction. Um, thank you also to each of our panelists, Paul, Seven, and Jessica, for joining us. I'm really looking forward to our conversation this hour. Um, and finally, just a thank you to the PRI team. Our research team, our comms team, have done an amazing job, as usual, in putting together this survey, uh, as well as putting together our webinar and our social media campaign. So please, uh, there's much more uh, in our actual survey. So go to our website and take a look and share it with everyone that you know. All right, so let's get started. Um, first, I'm gonna provide a, a background a little bit in terms of our methodology before providing an overview of some of our major findings from the survey today. Uh, we collected this data um, a few months ago in June. The margin of error for our sample is about plus or minus 1.6 percentage points. And our survey um, includes a representative sample of more than 5,000 adults from all over the country from Ipsos Knowledge Panel with a few supplementary, supplementary opt-in survey panelists to flesh out some of the smaller sample sizes. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of our findings. So the first thing that we asked about was whether or not um, Americans thought that climate change that we're seeing today is um, a function of human related activity, if it's a natural pattern that's happening with the earth, or if it's actually not even existence, in existence at all. And so among all Americans, we find a majority uh, believe that climate change is caused mostly by human activities, such as burning fossil fuels. 28% uh, believe it's really caused more by natural patterns, and one in 10 Americans uh, say that there's no evidence that climate change is happening at all which of course is not the scientific consensus. Climate change is happening and it's caused by, by human activities. Um, we see of course that attitudes about climate change are really strongly linked to partisanship and what sources of information Americans are getting their news. So for example, Democrats are more than three times as likely as the Republicans to believe that climate change is caused mostly by human activity. Um, and we see clearly that if you're watching mainstream television news, for example, you're far more likely to believe that climate change is caused by human activity as opposed to watching Fox News or far right news uh, sources. We also see that there is a relationship or a linkage between religious affiliation and causes of climate change attitudes. Um, most people of faith believe that climate change is caused mostly by human activity. I think that's an important point to recognize. You will see, however, as you go further down to um, the results of the bottom of the chart there, uh, that uh, white evangelical Protestants are the group that is the least likely to believe that climate change is caused by human activity. Um, similarly, Latter-day Saints also are the least likely to believe that. And what we find here, uh, not surprisingly, is that white evangelical Latter-day Saints are typically the most likely to be voting for Republicans in uh, in presidential and other elections. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about party and religion um, as, as we go on and the relationship between those two concepts moving on. We wanted to get a sense of Americans' attitudes about whether uh, the patterns that we're seeing with dramatic weather is evidence of what we might call the end times. And we first asked this question in 2014 uh, at PRI. So if we can go to the next slide here. 
Um, we asked Americans back in 2014 uh, the extent to which they agree that the severity of recent natural disasters, whether that's evidence that were in what the Bible would call the end times. And so we've seen a decline in that perspective. In 2014, almost half of Americans believe that. But by 2023, when we did our survey earlier this summer, it was just down to 35% of Americans. Um, not surprisingly, if you go to the bottom of the table here, uh, we see that people that are religiously unaffiliated are the least likely to believe in this idea. Excuse me. Um, but the two groups um, that are the most likely to adopt, I think, this sort of um, view of the end times and is linked to climate change are black Protestants and white evangelical Protestants. Although among evangelicals, there has been a decline in that viewpoint from 77% in 2014 to 62%. Uh, we have, we however find among black Protestants, three and four consistently believe that uh, these natural disasters that are occurring at a more frequent basis are indicative of the end times. We also asked about attitudes on Christian dominionism and environmental stewardship. And so with respect to the first question, um, the extent to which Americans agree that God has called Christians to exercise dominion over American society, this is a larger question that certainly doesn't just apply to how uh, humans should be treating the planet. Um, but it is sort of a, a, an ex a reason that some more conservative uh, religious groups in the past have essentially said that there's a rationale for not getting involved in dealing with the planet, because if God gives you dominion to do what you want with, with the planet, um, there's maybe less incentive to try to address uh, climate change issues. Um, we find that most Americans are not Christian dominionist, as we'd say, only about 21%, but certain groups that historically have had that those kinds of ideas, you tend to see more support for that idea. Um, among white evangelical Protestants, for example, 45% uh, hold this viewpoint. We see, however, far more bro uh, broad, broad support for the idea that um, that humans should live up to their God-given responsibility of being good stewards of the earth, whether that's an important or very important reason for protecting the earth or taking care of the earth. And here we see that most religious Americans, uh, regardless of their faith background, pretty strongly support that sort of idea. Um, even in some cases, perhaps in a surprising group, so we can unpack a little bit later today, white evangelical Protestants um, and Latter-day Saints are the groups that are among the most likely to believe that God has called them to take care of the earth. Um, and that's very important, an important reason for taking care of the environment. The so next slide. We also asked Americans the extent to which they feel some sort of spiritual connection to the earth uh, on a regular basis. And about half of Americans say on most days they feel a deep spiritual connection with nature and earth. Um, and again, among people of faith, most uh, Americans who subscribe to a religious tradition also express that they feel some sort of spiritual connection on a regular basis. Uh, the group that's most likely to do so are Latter-day Saints, 73%. Um, but again, we find white evangelical Protestants, a group that you often hear about, who are less supportive of um, efforts to mitigate climate change, are right along with other religious Americans expressing their, their um, feelings of being connected to the earth. Next, I wanna look at uh, whether or not Americans believe climate change is a crisis. And again, we did a survey in 2014 where we asked this very question. I think one thing that's really notable, even despite all of the severe weather that we're seeing, despite more scientific evidence that climate change is real, there's a certain intractability 23% of Americans in 2014 thought that climate change was a crisis. Uh, it's only 27% as of last summer. Um, in terms of religious breaks though, among those Americans who are religiously unaffiliated, we do see a, a definitely a bump in concern about climate being a crisis uh, from 33% 33, 33 roughly in 2014 to 43% in 2023. Um, but um, as you go down the line, we see less, I think, support for this idea that climate change is a crisis, particularly among white evangelicals and, and Latter-day Saints. We didn't have enough cases in 2014 to look at Latter-day Saints, but among white evangelicals, there wasn't necessarily lots of concern about climate change being a crisis in 2014, but that's even cratered to just 8% in 2023. We, of course, also gave Americans the options of, of in terms of thinking about climate change, whether it was a crisis, a major problem, a minor problem, or not a problem at all. And so we just wanted to present with you uh, a picture of what that looks like in terms of partisanship. So 
On the top level, we're not seeing much change in Americans' attitudes about the extent to which climate change is a crisis, a major problem, et cetera. But if you look below the surface at the partisan differences, we're seeing huge kinds of, of, of differences here. Uh, Democrats are far more likely to say it's a crisis or a major problem. We're seeing the reverse image when it comes to Republicans. And similar to some earlier data we showed in terms of the impact of news consumption, we see that if you view far right news, if you're watching Fox News, you're far less likely to think that climate change is a, uh, is a crisis or even a major problem. Uh, one thing we did want to point out uh, is that there are generational splits on concerns about climate change, which I don't think is surprising to anyone that looks at the politics of Gen Z these days. 34% um, of Generation Z views climate change as a crisis, an additional 36% also view it as a major problem. But this generational difference isn't just linked to Gen Z compared to older Americans. We see that millennials also care, I think, about climate change and recognize it as being a crisis or a major problem compared to older Americans. Finally, we asked a battery of questions with respect to support for policies that would mitigate climate change. Um, we asked about five specific questions in particular. I'm not going to read all of them. There's much more detail in the actual report. But so, for example, if you look at, if we can go back to the previous slide, very good. Um, we asked about increasing funding for research, putting limits on, on carbon dioxide and, and companies that produce uh, fossil fuels, even asking also if, if it means raising taxes or increases um, the cost of electricity or the price of cars, for example. On all these issues, you will not be shocked to find that Republicans and Democrats uh, have very different views. Uh, the one exception, though, we did find widespread part bipartisan support for providing tax breaks. So most Americans, regardless of their party, party, think that they'd be supportive of providing tax breaks for individuals to adopt renewable energy sources in their home. So we put these policies together in a scale. And so essentially the scale is, on a, if you score a zero, you have no support for any of these policies. The closer you get to one, the more widespread support that you have. And so all Americans on this scale are at a score of about 0.57. And you probably won't be shocked to learn, given what we see in some earlier slides, that there is um, uh, a pattern when it comes to religious affiliation. Um, Americans who are not religiously affiliated or uh, Americans who belong to a non-Christian religion um, are more likely to be supportive of those policies in general. Um, the groups least likely to be supportive are Latter-day Saints and white evangelical Protestants. And similarly, if you look to the right, we also, in the larger report, break out religiosity and the salience of religiosity. And so for Americans, the less re important religion is to their lives, the more likely they are to be supportive of these general policies to mitigate the effects of climate change. And I think that is our last slide, and we're going to be turning it over now to our panelists. But I think first, Belinda is going to be introducing our panelists. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so yeah, we have some amazing panelists here to kind of dive deeper into this data with us. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Dr. Paul Jupe, who is a political scientist and director of the Data for Political Research program at Denison University in Granville, Ohio. His research is focused on religion and politics, specifically the evolving place of religion in the democratic process. He is co-author of The Evangelical Crackup, The Future of the Evangelical Republican Coalition, and he co-authored The Full Armor of God, The Mobilization of Christian Nationalism in American Politics. We also are joined by Savim Kalyanku, who is the executive director of Green Muslims, an organization that is engaging both locally in Washington, D.C. and nationally as a resource to the Muslim community for spiritually inspired environmental education, action and reflection since 2007. Uh, Savim is involved in multiple local climate action groups, and she's dedicated to helping educate young people about the importance of environmental well-being for spiritual, mental and physical wellness purposes. We are also joined, last but not least, by Reverend Dr. Jessica Mormon, who is the president and CEO of Evangelical Environmental Network. She wears many hats as a climate and environmental scientist, pastor, educator, and advocate who has appeared on national TV media outlets, including the NBC Today Show, Good Morning America, Christian Broadcasting Network, and Newsmax. We'll hear first from Dr. Paul Jupe. So, Paul, over to you. 
Thanks so much, um, Belinda. It was, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was thrilled to hear that my friends at PRI were digging into environmental issues again, and I'm grateful to be here to offer a few comments. So one of the things I've appreciated most about PRI is their willingness to shake things up and bring insight and creativity to their polling. They are certainly not bound by Gallup's wording from 1972, and that has been especially important in their work on environment and religion. And so let just give you a little bit of background. Um, for instance, in uh, 2012 survey, so about a decade ago, they included an experiment that simply varied the order of a forced choice between beliefs that have been argued to be fundamental to the role of religion in the environmental debate. So on the one hand, a dominion belief that God gave human beings the right to use the planet for human benefit versus a stewardship belief. God gave human beings the task of living responsibly um, on the planet, which and not just for human benefit. And we tend to think of these things as these religious beliefs as if they were fixed stars in people's heavens. But when the Dominion statement was read first, only 21% adopted, adopted it. But when it, when it was presented second, 55% adopted it. And that is a huge swing in what's thought to be very kind of fundamental ways of, of thinking about the world and the environment. So they're much more flexible, I think, than we thought. And because PRI shares their data, um, another social scientist and I, Ryan Burge, were able to publish this as part of an article in the journal Politics and Religion. And that creativity extends to the current survey as well. Um, at least one of the innovations of this effort, and there were many, is to ask both religious and secular beliefs about the environment, as well as the values that individuals hold that would promote envir environmental preservation. So they're in, these are entirely novel data finding that 28% believe God would not allow humans to destroy the earth. 50%, 52% agree that most days I feel a deep spiritual connection with nature and the earth. And 35% agree that the severity of recent, recent natural disasters is evidence that we're living in the end times, as Melissa said. Um, and I see that decline from 2014. And I wonder if, if COVID eclipsed the importance of environmental problems um, for the moment. So at least I, I saw that spike in, um, in end times beliefs with COVID a couple of years ago. So anyway, for the first time, we can associate specific applicable religious beliefs with values that could be reasons for protecting the environment, um, including preventing human suffering and harm, living up to our responsibility to protect other species, both of which have huge support um, in the American populace, and knowing that some environmental damage can never be undone. And these are clearly living in tension um, with the belief that climate is changing because of natural causes. So last thing, I know we don't have much time, but last thing I'll mention is that likely role of dominionism. Um, and it's interesting that it's not just, of course, it's not just limited to environmental protection um, where it is long figured, but it's in American politics more generally. And if you're paying any attention, I think, to the media at all, um, you see this, um, you know, it's much more audible, it's much more organized, and these days it's much more radical um, as well. In fact, I just heard a sermon by a far-right pastor who was taking offense to climate change especially to the plight of the polar bears, because it suggested that God had not planned this out and Christians um, should be in charge of it. Anyway, I very much looking look forward to digging into the data further to see how all these pieces fit together. And I want to amplify quickly the clear takeaway from these results, that there's a deep, consistent, reasoned agreement in the American public about the necessity of protecting the environment and addressing climate change. However, the holdouts are few, um, and they may be entrenched and especially polarized by partisanship, and I think we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So let me pass the mic to Savim. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to PRRI for inviting me from Green Muslims to come and speak today. I'm speaking with others who have uh, quite a bit more expertise on the topic, I feel, but I am able to share a little bit of a, a minority perspective on these issues. Green Muslims has been around for a while now, but has been growing in recent years as the, the American Muslim interest in nature and climate issues has been growing. Um, we offer a lot of educational programs, uh, in, including teaching people just about our local environment. I'm a naturalist by training, so I like to talk about plants and animals here in the Washington DC metro area where we're located. But we also try to help American Muslims connect uh, their faith with nature and with climate action. So we, how we also share Islamic teachings about um, the relationship between the planet and humans and God's teachings as to what our responsibilities are here on earth. And we really emphasize these days um, one particular interpretation of a key term in Islamic theology, which is khalifa uh, or 
stewards of the earth. And we are taught in the Quran that God teaches that all humans are the Khalifa of the earth. So this is a major emphasis of the work of green Muslims today, just helping our community develop a better understanding of our responsibility as humans here on earth. And I am definitely seeing um, a growth, especially in, the, in recent years, as far as our community's interest in being outdoors and learning about nature. And with that comes an increased care for the environment and increased environmental activism. So I, I uh, have to admit that I was pleased but not surprised by the findings of the survey that the majority of religious Americans are paying attention to climate change because I'm seeing it that increase within my own community. And with that, that understanding that we are religiously obligated to caring for the earth. I don't know that this concept has always existed, but it has always made sense to me at a personal level. And it is a major aspect of what Green Muslims is teaching. So seeing that it, it expands beyond the American Muslim community, that people of faith are particularly concerned and are making steps, taking steps to fulfill a religious obligation to care for the planet is quite comforting. I interact with a lot of um, interfaith groups, especially here in the Washington DC metro area. And so I know there are plenty of people of faith who do care. Uh, thus, I wasn't totally shocked, but pleased to see that it's still, it's a majority opinion. What surprised me a bit from the survey was the lack of an increase in sense of urgency. And I, I appreciate the comments from the previous speaker about how maybe the COVID situation um, pulled us back from climate action. Within my own community, I kind of feel the opposite. Uh, COVID got a lot of people outdoors and it got them thinking more about nature. So within the American Muslim community, I feel like COVID was actually a little boost in concern for, for climate issues. So I assumed that that was going to be uh, a majority view or not it would expand beyond just the Muslim American community. So I was a little bit surprised to see that that was not the case. But all in all, I have to admit, I was most intrigued by the subject that is nearest and dearest to my heart, which is the connection between spirituality and faith. I was um, very pleased and intrigued to see that there is a majority opinion of people who put their faith together with nature, because I know that's my personal experience. Uh, yet I was surprised that that n number was lower for younger generations. And I wonder if that has something to do with technology, with people being more indoors and focused on their screens. But all in all, I was uh, impressed to see that that, that that connection between nature and faith is not, number one, unique to me, not unique to the people that I'm interacting with, and is actually a majority opinion. So I was um, particularly interesting, and I would have so much more to say, but I do need to pass this on to another speaker. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Savine. And it is a pleasure to join you all this morning. Um, I am Jessica Mormon, President and CEO of the Evangelical Environmental Network. We represent millions of pro-life Christians who have taken action with us for clean air, pure water, and a safe climate. Our mission is to lead our fellow evangelicals in rediscovering and reclaiming that biblical mandate to care for God's creation. And our vision, the reason why we do this, is so that every child has the hope and expectation for a safe climate and a healthy, pollution-free world to grow up in and thrive in. And for us as evangelicals, acting on climate, reducing pollution, is a matter of life. It's central to us partnering with Jesus in his mission to bring abundant life for all, as he says in John 10.10. 10. I want to thank the PRI team for this very important report and for the opportunity to provide a perspective. And as an evangelical, I, I expect to see one of the main uh, narratives taken from the report in the media is that only 31% of white evangelicals agree that climate change today is primarily due to human activity. As an evangelical climate scientist who studied for 15 years uh, this exact question, um, I would be lying if I said this isn't disheartening. And this certainly also means that we at EEN and our youth arm Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, we certainly haven't worked ourselves out of a job yet. But for me, this isn't my main takeaway. Um, similar to Savine, um, 
what the report really underscores for me is um, that lack of change in uh, Americans calling climate change a crisis over the last decade. And for me, what this communicates is actually that the typical environmental messaging that we've had around climate change has reached a saturation point. And in this critical decade for climate action, we can't afford for this stagnation to continue. Respectfully, I believe that we're seeing what we're seeing is that that typical environmental messaging, that one size fits all approach that's been used over the last few decades has reached its limit. It's something that has resonated most and moved a politically left-leaning audience, but left potential independent conservative-leaning advocates on the sidelines. Moving forward, um, I think this report really underscores that we need to follow what the social science research says, which is to use tailored messages delivered by trusted messengers for each unique group, and especially for groups like my fellow white evangelicals and political conservatives. So that means evangelicals talking to evangelicals, conservatives talking to conservatives, Catholics talking to Catholics, Black and Hispanic Protestants speaking to Black and Hispanic Protestants, and with messages that resonate best with each unique group tailored for them. We also see that youth messengers in each group are also really, really important. And so this is what we've been doing at EEN with evangelicals for the last 15 years, highlighting how climate and pollution is harming the lives and health of our children, our loved ones, the most vulnerable in society right now, and that acting on climate is a matter of life. And we've got a great track record for this as well. For example, the Republican lead of the Senate Bipartisan Solutions Caucus cites support from evangelicals and youth in his home state for giving him the courage to take the lead on climate within the Republican Party. This report also provides significant takeaway for our focus on human health impacts with large majorities in each religious and political group, including 80% of evangelicals and over 70% of Republicans saying that preventing human suffering and protecting future generations is a very or extremely important reason to protect the environment. Another significant finding from this report, I think, is showing that evidence for the potential for a tailored approach. And so while headlines may cite that only 31% of evangel white evangelicals acknowledge human-caused climate change, I see this as the floor, especially if we continue to use that one-size-all-fit um, environmental messaging. And I think the worst thing we can do is to take this number and write off evangelicals and conservatives as a lost cause. To the contrary, I see the 80% of white evangelicals, Black Protestants who believe in the importance of living up to our God-given role as stewards to take care of the earth. This shows the great potential for real and significant movement for climate action in the next decade if we change tactics and invest in those tailored messages from trusted messengers, such as our use of the human health message that we've been pioneering at EEN. This report also provides an excellent roadmap for doing this, not only with conservatives and evangelicals, but across all of the groups studied for moving them um, not just from acknowledgement, but into action as well. Well. And so with that, I'd love to hand the mic over to Melissa. Thank you, Jessica, Sabine Paul. Those are all absolutely wonderful comments. And um, I wish we had more than uh, half an hour to unpack all of it. But I actually want to ask a larger question to um, our panelists um, and really getting at how to unpack the relationship between religion, partisanship, and all of the attitudes that we're, we're seeing here. I mean, I think, you know, as Jessica pointed out at the, the end, she is hopeful that we're seeing a floor in terms of white evangelical Protestants acknowledging that climate change is caused by humans. She's pointing to data that looks at, you know, overwhelming support for values in terms of trying to change um, uh, or mitigate the effects of, of climate change. I think Paul also recognized the importance that we didn't even cover that in the slideshow, but there's much more about that in the report, but the role of values and trying to, I think, get people to, to be more proactive in dealing with, with, these, um, with these really existential sorts of issues. But I'm just wondering if the panelists might speak to um, what they see 
see as the relationship between partisanship and religion and attitudes. Like, how do we unpack those sorts of things uh, in American culture and society? So I want to start maybe with Paul, who, as our social scientist, has looked at this for, for decades, like I have, but his thoughts on how it affects attitudes about climate change in particular, and then maybe move on to Jessica and to them in, ter in terms of their own day-to-day -day advocacy work of looking at partisanship and whether it helps or hurts their their causes. Paul. I appreciate you calling me old, Melissa. Um. <laughs> I'm old too, so it, it works. <laughs> this is not wrong. Um, it's not wrong. <laughs> but no, I mean, you're you're exactly right to to point to this, um, and I think I I would echo what what Jessica had to say, which is um, to recognize that across time, um, religion and partisanship have really clearly sorted together, um, and because the parties are so polarized at this point, that it's really difficult to have cross partisan conversations. So probably do have to have actors that are that are you know within the house um, and willing to make those calls um so you know we can point to say like Bob Inglis for for example who was a Republican congressman right um and and there are of course many others including EEN um at this point it's really difficult I think to compete with um with the Republican Party which is not sending out pro-environmental signals um and of course the the news media so I mean religion you know like churches are are putting out some of these messages but I don't know that they can compete effectively yet with um you know with kind of conservative media and and the Republican Party so it's gonna be difficult Maybe we go to Jessica on that and then follow up with Sabem because it's, you know, I think that there's some similarities in some of the comments that we both made. Absolutely. This is a fantastic question. Um, political partisanship undoubtedly is the undercurrent behind the divide we see between religious group groups on on climate. And that's why um, I just I believe that making climate a nonpartisan issue is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's why investing in trusted messengers like evangelicals, conservative messengers is so important. Um, as the report shows, we've seen backtracking among evangelicals from 2014 to 2023 to today, and that can be attributed to the Trump effect with President Trump continually calling climate change a hoax. His influence certainly has set back progress that we had made prior to that. And you could say that we're facing a bit of a David and Goliath situation when it comes to reaching evangelicals and conservatives, as was just pointed out. But as with David and Goliath, there are significant reasons for hope. And I'll share, I share a little bit. We've heard about the partisan influence of partisan media. As a pastor myself, I know this common saying firsthand that pastors, we have our congregants for one hour of the week, while partisan media has them for the rest of the week. That is a real challenge. The other challenge is the lack of funding for center, right-leaning, conservative, and evangelical groups who are advocating for sound climate action. An assessment of these funding levels shows that less than 1% of climate funding has gone to moderate and conservative leaning groups who are best positioned to uh, uh, reach the groups who have uh, low acceptance rates from this report. And I'd say if we had seen the same level of investment in conservative groups as has been given to uh, left-leaning groups over the last decade to combat that misinformation about climate change within our communities, I think we'd see significantly different results in this report. At the same time, as it was mentioned, we're facing record levels of misinformation targeted at conservatives, at evangelicals. And so bringing... Uh, uh, parity in terms of investment to lift up conservative and evangelical messengers with those tailored messages um, is where what we need to do to see progress. And we've already began to see just with the little levels of investment, significant moving movement on that, even within the Republican Party. Um, I'm really excited to see what even a doubling of that could do. Ben, did you have any thoughts about sort of the unpacking the relationship between party and religion, maybe examples from your work at Green Muslims? Well, as you know, as a nonprofit organization, non uh, politically affiliated, I probably shouldn't say too much. What I can note is that within the Muslim community, I think it's going to be religion more than politics that's going to influence uh, views on 
on climate action, on the environment. And so I would, I would even step away from the political side of it all and just try to go straight into how the religion can be used to influence and educate the community. Okay, fair enough. Um, I actually wanna um, extend this conversation a little bit by asking Jessica, maybe Paul, their thoughts about looking at generational change within evangelicals. Um, I'm not sure if Paul has any data available, but but I, I, for, for Jessica, is there a sense that younger evangelicals, because we've seen Gen Z generally, uh, is more likely to be concerned about climate change? They're going to have to be living with it, the effects of it much longer than Paul and I, who are admittedly very old, will. Uh, so I'm just curious, do you see any generational sorts of uh, issues at play with, with evangelicals? Yeah, there's <laughs> big generational um uh, dynamics at play with evangelicals and with conservatives. And so our young evangelicals, young conservatives are one of our best messengers for uh, bringing that message to their elders about the need for urgent climate action. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing that generational divide is that um, for uh, older generations, uh, again, coming to this issue of climate change really started from a political lens. Whereas for young evangelicals, young conservatives, and I don't know if I'd call myself young, but I know this is my pathway into it as well as a millennial, is that I came to this issue first through my faith. I became a climate scientist because of my faith and because I wanted to go into ministry. This was the particular assignment after prayer that, that God uniquely gave me. Um, and I'm seeing this over and over again with young evangelicals, young conservatives um, who aren't carrying the same cultural and political uh, baggage that maybe the older generations are. And that's why I think it is so important to approach these topics, uh, the topic of climate change from a religious and spiritual standpoint, why it's so important to have religious organizations like Green Muslims, like EN acting on this, because we can start from that common value that we find in our religious traditions that is is nonpartisan, should be nonpartisan, and can be, begin to build that foundation back up. Paul, what about you? What are your thoughts about looking at maybe conservative religious groups from a generational perspective? No, I think it's a great idea. Um, and it's something that I think we do every time we get a new big survey out that allows us to check this out, right? Um, and, you know, there there is some change among um, younger religious, uh, younger religious Americans, and in the ways that you might think, but of course, it lives in, and so I'm thinking about the vote in particular. Um, and of course, it lives in tension, if they have um, more green perspectives, it lives in tension with, say, a pro-life abortion attitude, or perhaps anti-gay rights um, kind of attitude. And so, you know, those young voters um, have to weigh which one is going to be more important, and at least historically to this point, haven't dug into this data, of course, but um, to this point, they've prioritized those other values, they've stuck with the Republican Party and not it doesn't look like they're advocating within, say, the Republican Party to change those um, change those views, and that doesn't mean that it's not going to change across time. Um, but it's but it's a very slow process, and at this point, at least, it doesn't look like that's the top of the priority of the agenda um, for those for those young voters. But look forward to the future. I have a question about sort of changing attitudes, maybe changing hearts and minds about this issue among people of faith and among Americans more, more generally. But uh, one of the questions that we have asked from the audience, I think speaks to this. Um, you know, Jessica, you talked about the need for trusted messengers within conservative circles, within evangelical circles to actually change people's uh, attitudes. But what about interfaith communication? So is there a sense to, and maybe Seven and, and Jessica can speak to this specifically in their roles, um, to what extent are you working with other faith groups um, based on their shared, shared interest. Multi-faith collaboration, I think, is absolutely important because we have so many shared and common values across our traditions. But what I do think is important that as we collaborate together, that we also do that uniquely in each of our voices, because that's when we get not just um, a singing the same chorus, but a true symphony. And when it comes to uh, really seeing change, uh, first hearing uh, the advocate 
advocacy for important solutions coming from all different angles for all of the unique and diverse reasons of why we do are coming to that, I think is also important with that. Um, so while, uh, again, I think multi-faith collaboration, again, is absolutely critical, but we need to do that from our unique voices and our unique traditions. I completely second that. Um, I couldn't have said it as well as Jessica herself uh, just elaborated. Interfaith work is what has supported the work of Green Muslims, for example, for many years, but it will never have the same impact of something coming from within the community itself, from the religious leaders within the community itself in changing people's focus um, towards the environment. And while we've needed it and we need it to bring about worldwide change, like we'll have to work together as different, different faiths, people of different faiths, different congregations. And we will have to, you know, again, it can't just be, oh, we can agree on a few words and that's all we say. We have to give the message and give it from our own perspectives and show those in charge that the majority of people, the majority of Americans are concerned um, to have that strong voice from within each religious group the change has to occur internally as well. And one thing that the Muslims has been looking at, again, focused solely on the uh, American Muslim experience, is how can the religious teachings be reinterpreted to emphasize environmental concerns and emphasize that role of humanity as caring for the physical environment of the earth. The words are there, but these concerns weren't always at the top of the American Muslim community's concerns or the worldwide Muslim community's concerns. And now we need to look back at our current situation and see what our religion teaches because the teachings from, from a Muslim perspective, the proof will always have to come from the religious text and the examples of the prophet Muhammad peace be upon it. That's the fundamental, but that is doable. When I go back and read, I can see it. I can see those messages there. God talking about our relationship with the earth and our responsibilities on the earth. It's there, but now we need not just a nonprofit like Green Muslims, but we need religious leaders to be doing that research and reformulating the understanding and sharing it in their, in their Friday sermons to the people and emphasizing how this is a key aspect of being a good person, of being a good Muslim and of our service to God. And so once we can get that fundamental um, step made within our community, then we'll be in a better position to interact with other faith-based communities to form an even larger voice as to why we should be taking care of the environment. Great. So just a reminder to uh, those of you viewing at home, um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. We have a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to talk about something we haven't raised to this point is really some of the findings with respect to race and ethnicity. I think one of the things that really sticks out to me and a lot of the questions is the extent to which people of color, and typically they're more religious as well, um, are embracing the, I think, seriousness of climate change and are more supportive of policies that seek to mitigate that. So I'm just wondering in your own lines of work and, and data that you've been looking at, uh, what's helping to explain those findings, do you think? Maybe I'll start with Paul first, our social scientist. Well, I think, I mean, depending on how we, so like when we talk about the environment and climate, it's really diverse, right? And there's so many different problems that we could potentially talk about. Um, but if we think in part about urban areas, that tends to be where a number of different pollution um, kind of problems can be found, right? And so um, that's part of it, just kind of the everyday lived experience of, of many people of color who happen to be concentrated in urban areas. And of course, that is correlated with their religion um, as well. But of course, religious communities are taking it on too as, as vital representation um, of the interests of, of their community. So I think I think that's a, a good part of what's going on here, but probably not everything. I think the, you know, weather, weather systems, people uh, living in, in homes that haven't been you know, regulated properly and built properly. And so like poverty is obviously an issue here um, for the kinds of problems people are facing about the climate and storms. So there's a lot of different things that can be at stake here. But but I think it places religion as kind of a, a central representational role for, um, for all kinds of communities, especially um, people of color. Great. I'll jump in and echo that as we speak with our Black and Hispanic evangelical brothers and sisters. Again, it does come to, and we look at 
medical research that's showing that it is community of colors, communities of color who are most impacted by climate solution, by climate impacts, dirty air, polluted water. They're living extreme heat. They're living that out day in, day out because of the legacy of unjust housing practices and other unjust practices of the past. And so that is where our duty as uh, religious communities and as society at large is to engage in that restorative action for that. Um, and I, I, Again, I think that also when we look at solutions, another thing, one thing that we're always keeping in mind, um, and I love to lift up, is that when we look at climate solutions, they are benefit multipliers. When we are looking at a climate solution, it's a solution to clean wear clean air. It's a clean water solution. It's a pollution solution. And so we can also meet folks, one, um, whether... Um, that's on uh, different uh, racial demographic lines or across the political divide. Everyone wants clean air. Everyone wants clean water. We can lift up that message. And that's what we're doing at EEN of lifting up those solutions to pollution that also serve as climate solutions, help folks make that direct link to something that they can see impacting their lives right now. I've always thought too that an emphasis that's on clean air, clean water, pollution has a far broader support than the idea of climate change, right? And, and packing that once again, and how you make those two, two ideas, they're not, you know, and they're not mutually exclusive, right? but for, I think for some political actors on the political right, we, we're seeing that, that happening. I think that that kind of an approach has potential in rural areas, for example, right? So that, that I think really speaks to uh, a lot of, um, religious Americans who live in those sorts of those environments. Um, we have a couple of more specific questions from the audience here. So Savan, we have a question about the right to water for animals in Islam. Uh, so we have a board member from the Interfaith Partisanship for the Chesapeake. Um, if you have uh, engaged in any of the work that IPC does, but also your, your thoughts and perspectives on the right to water for animals in Islam. We did not ask that in our survey. So that's a very specific question, but I'm now intrigued to hear the answer. <laughs> Well, I'm intrigued by the question, and I will not uh, claim to be stating an answer. I, am, unfortunately, am not an Islamic scholar, so I can only give my own personal interpretation. But from my own understanding, and I, I look forward to continuing this conversation with IPC as well. Um, uh, but from my own personal understanding, well, we have a concept in Islam um, in regards to uh, the use of animals as food for humans, so as meat and the proper slaughter of animals, refer to it as as a the biha process. And until recently, that has generally been interpreted interpreted by most of the Muslims I've interacted with, and even myself, as an issue of how the animal is slaughtered. Is it slaughtered according to Islamic rules in the name of God? Is the blood drained properly? We are now, as a community, looking into the bigger picture. It's not just an issue of how the animal is slaughtered. It's how the animal lived its entire life. To follow the rules of the religion, to follow the rules of God, is not just to slaughter it in the name of God. It's to raise it according to God's rules and to raise it in the most humane, kind way possible. And so these issues are now coming up in our community in a way that they never have before. And... I would say for those who think about it and reflect on it, the general understanding is humane treatment of animals for the use of meat or for the use of humans in any way is obligatory in Islam. And we do need to look into exactly what that means, but for many it means, well, it makes, they need to make sure that they are eating the proper food, that they are living in the proper circumstances. It can't be chickens all housed in a box together, for example. Um, Muslims want to make that effort to make sure that any any meat they consume is the biha. It's not just how the animal was slaughtered, but that it was raised, raised humanely. And we need to dig deeper into our own teachings about what is considered to be humane treatment of animals. But it is a major question that is coming up these days that 10 years ago, we never, never even thought about, at least in, in my understanding. So it's an excellent question. I would love to talk more about it. Uh, proper, kind, treatment of animals, healthy treatment of animals is obligatory, but as far as the details go, a lot more work needs to be done on that. 
Thank you. Uh, I have a question actually for Jessica from the audience. Um, Jessica mentioned having local or personal messengers tailored to the groups. How would you encourage these messengers to be informed and connected to a, and to a similar consensus in regards to emphasizing climate crisis? Yeah, I think the, the answer there, and this is a fantastic question, is again, coming together around uh, climate solutions. We all come to that, those solutions, the fact that climate change is happening now, it's urgent, it's bad, it's caused by us. <laughs> coming together around that to look at solutions. Um, and with our, uh, uh, what I would call our symphony of voices to work towards those solutions uh, with great urgency. And one thing that I will say is as a, a climate scientist who has studied that component of whether the climate change we see today is because of human activity or just part of Earth's natural climate cycle, because I know full well, climate's always changed. What makes this different? And uh, again, after 150 years of research from climate scientists, of which I got to contribute to that as well, um, we've got some really great answers. We know that it is us. And that is actually good news because it can means that we, can, for the first time in history, can do something about it. We're not just at the mercy of nature. And us coming together for all of our diverse and unique reasons towards that common uh, set of solutions is where we can see a lot of movement and momentum. Great. Um, we have also another question um, in terms of whether we have looked into faith community views about the fossil fuel industry. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, is there any polling out there or maybe um, any, any studies that kind of look at the impact of Americans' attitudes on oil? And, you know, I know that the Republican Party line currently these days is to try to be energy independent, which for them means doing more drilling as opposed to investing in solar, or investing in renewable resources there. So any sense, maybe even Paul, have you seen any work or maybe Jessica, have you seen groups in terms of how they view the fossil fuel industry? Any sort of idea? Might be a good question to ask in the future. <laughs> I haven't seen direct polling, but I do know one of the common talking points is that um, we need fossil fuels to advance global prosperity, that we are in this place of prosperity for many because of fossil fuels and industrialization. And so we need that then to spread that to the rest of the world and um, uh, lift folks out of poverty. We now have the two things. With that, it came the shadow side of not only the prosperity from the energy, but the shadow side of the emissions of greenhouse gases like CO2, but also toxic air pollutants, water pollution um, that has uh, uh, taken a hit at our, um, our, our health and well-being. In America, it's two, medical research shows 200,000 Americans each, each year die early because of fossil fuel sourced air pollution. This include is everyone from our children, both born and unborn, all the way to the elderly and the most vulnerable in society. Around the world, 6.7 million die early worldwide because of toxic air pollution that comes from the fossil fuel industry. There's the shadow side of those, the missions. The good news is, is with technological innovation, we now have sources of, of clean energy from renewables to advanced nuclear to other sources of um, clean energy that doesn't come with those emissions. Advancing a diverse energy portfolio and working towards zero and even uh, uh, negative emissions using natural climate solutions CO2 sequestration, that is what we need to be marching towards so that we lift folks out of poverty with energy, with clean energy that doesn't have those harmful health effects that the fossil fuel industry has had. Well, we have about five minutes left, so I thought we could use the remainder of our time to ask the panelists um, what we're missing here. So if you could redesign the survey, if you could put another survey out in a year from now, what sorts of questions, especially with respect to the role of religion and spirituality, would you like to see us be addressing in the future when it comes to the issue of climate change? So I'll start with Paul and Sebim and then end with Jessica. 
there's always so many things. Um, I have a wish list. <laughs> I've lived for this moment. Um, you know, I mean, what, what, what you've been doing for a long time is, is really pretty amazing. Um, and what's nice about it is that we have this, you know, kind of smorgasbord, this huge supply of, of really interesting questions to unpack a lot. And the thing that we still don't understand is how much of this is actually talked about in congregations, right? So like, how often is it once a year? How, you know, are they digging into these values? Are they digging into the beliefs? Is there resistance? Is there, you know, what, what do those dynamics look like? And that's kind of reaching back um, into my career, but I would love to know kind of at that sort of um, that middle level of how much say clergy are talking about this and how much other faith leaders and congregations are, are getting the word out in local communities. Cause obviously they're, they're crucial, um, uh, supplier of, of credible values and beliefs that could that could really drive um, this process forward, and of course it you know could intervene in that sorting process as well. Um, keep some people in who are otherwise turned off by conservative politics. But anyway, um, I, I would focus on you know kind of what they're hearing and and living that tension between the sort of national media and and local trusted sources. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, so then, what do you think we should be asking in the future? So number one, ditto to what Paul just said. Um, I'm very curious as to what people are learning from within their their communities. We talk with several groups, but we we don't have com you know communication with all um, American Muslim organizations, of course. So I'd love to know more. But I guess I need to step back and say, making sure that there's more of a minority voice being heard and reaching out to minority religious groups, non-Christian groups especially, and um, knowing who is saying what. And then uh, I guess in the back of my head, the connection between religion and politics from a Muslim perspective is perhaps a little bit unique, um, but I would love to hear where that's going these days. Again, Green Muslims isn't gonna go directly into that, but it's a personal interest of mine. So that's what I would ask. Terrific. Yeah, and we had some questions about um, from the audience on looking at non-Christians and, um, you know, the challenge, of course, with survey research, we have wonderful gold standard, you know, random based probability samples that we use, but even at 5,000 Americans, it's still hard to accumulate enough of um, those minority views. And so uh, anytime we had funding or we could find funding for these sorts of things, we'd love to do it, but it's always a challenge of survey research to do it. But I'm very mindful that you know, there is a huge, rich religious diversity in this country and trying to kind of unpack that more systematically um, is something that I think would be be terrific, but often challenging uh, in our work. But the last word will go to Jessica. So what should we be looking at in the future in our future research? Right. Well, again, this is a hard question to answer because um, the work is so comprehensive. But I think one thing that I'd love to see more of is um, uh, questions on the solutions. I think uh, one of the caveats that many of the solutions had is that these will come at a cost, that these will come with sacrifice, and would love to see um, some other solutions offered that um, really resonate um, with uh, more moderate and conservative audiences, um, and also uh, reflect the landscape of today where uh, it is cheaper for a utility to put in a utility scale solar farm or wind farm than it is to uh, build a new natural gas plant. And so we're seeing that um, a relationship between good environmental stewardship coming at the cost of a strong economy, both uh, at the macro and micro levels. We're seeing that get decoupled. I'd love to see that in the solutions. I'd love to see some solutions on... Um, uh, uh, natural climate solutions, harnessing the power of nature, um, how uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, addressing global emissions through foreign pollution fees, market-based solutions where the revenues go back to the public, plugging wasteful methane leaks from oil and gas that is good stewardship of our precious natural resources and not letting those resources just literally fritter away to the atmosphere and cause more warming. So I'd love to see sort of that more diversity in the amazing menu of solutions that we have at hand. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us here. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Belen, who's gonna close us out. All right, uh, very well said. Thank you all for engaging in this really thoughtful discussion and for reflecting on, you know, how it is 
we as Americans can dig deeper into our own religious teachings and thinking about climate. Thank you, PRRI team, especially our research team for compiling this report. Thanks to all of you for tuning into this event. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PRRI poll. We have this beautiful little QR code here that you can <laughs> take your phone out and uh, follow us on social media now. And you can also visit us on PRI.org to view the report and sign up for our latest facts and findings. So until next time, thanks all.